Our treasured healthcare systems have not been indexed properly to the current times with people now living longer. Seniors are shifting from living out their well-deserved twilight years in comfortable retirement to being forced to sell their homes and or live in poverty. Here in Ontario, small business is being squeezed into bankruptcy by provincial and federal regulations and is becoming a casualty of the big box warehouse store wars. A national and local infrastructure deficit now nearing $600 billion, while municipalities own more than 50% of public infrastructure, we only collect eight cents on every tax dollar. As a result, we are chronically underfunded, unable to maintain the health and efficiency of our infrastructure, which hinders our prosperity. The invasive aquatic plant water soldier has infiltrated the federal Trent Severn waterway, yet our federal government has been practically invisible to the point it may now be too little, too late, to stop it from invading the Great Lakes. The announcement of a federal balance budget does little to impress me when there is no announcement of a new plan to pay down the federal debt, which now stands in excess of $612 billion, $4.2 million nationally. Trent Hills balances budget every year. It's more than just pulling some campaign promise numbers out of the air with absolutely no plan on how to pay for them, and all parties are doing that. It's about a vision and a solid business plan that makes good sense mathematically so that citizenry can understand and support it. The questions are, what qualifications do you possess to positively address and help solve these issues? And without municipalities being recognized under the Canadian Constitution, what is your party's perspective on federal issues that have a direct impact on rural municipalities and how will you and your party involve local municipal government as partners? Thank you very much. <laughs> He's exempt from that. Um, okay. Does everyone, do all the candidates understand the question that was asked? Okay, um, I've allowed two minutes for this. We'll start with Patricia. <laughs> well, that's quite a problem you've laid out for us, Hector. The Green Party of Canada commits to providing $6.4 billion per year, or one point of the HST, to municipalities. The Green Party also proposes gathering together provincial, municipal, First Nations leaders along with federal government leaders, treating all as partners so there's direct communication from the feds, province, municipal. So in other words, to involve municipalities, improve communications. The debt you mentioned, personal debt of $1.65 for each dollar earned for Canadians, that is a huge issue. The Green Party supports a plan to allow people to uh, use a reverse mortgage sort of financing system in their senior years if that's if they need to draw income. So there is one private corporation doing that now, but this would be a uh, government program to allow people to access equity in homes if they're homeowners. Qualifications. Why am I running? Well. I'm a healthcare provider, I understand healthcare, I understand aging, I understand budgets. I was a single mother, I'm now also a grandmother. I um, appreciate that we have different challenges at different points in our lives. I have uh, been successful in my healthcare career because I've been able to draw people together, negotiate, mediate, and even work with medical doctors which I claim is quite an achievement. <laughs> so I thank you. Uh, that's my synopsis of an answer. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, Hector, that was quite the question. And I'm going to say right up front, there's no way I can answer every one of those elements of your question. There's only two questions. Mm -hmm. In terms of my my experience and my qualifications. I've lived in this community for almost 40 years. I created about 50 jobs. When I was chair of physician recruitment for West Northumberland Hospital, I brought eight physicians to this riding, family doctors, and it wasn't because we offered them money. It was because I and my team took them to meet the hockey coaches, made them understand that this was a great place to live. I have 
through my work as uh, Chair of Children's Services Committee, President of the Chamber of Commerce, founder of Cook School Daycare, created childcare spaces and jobs. I have a long history of taking issues within this riding and finding solutions to them. And understand, I don't do it alone. I do it as a team. That We have a lot of very talented people in this riding. And they're eager to help. I asked earlier in the debate earlier, who in this room volunteers? Who in this room donates? We do it because we want a better community. I'm passionate. Some people might have noticed that. In terms of the infrastructure deficit you mentioned, I have said it earlier tonight and I'm going to repeat it. Justin Trudeau has a plan to grow this economy and addressing infrastructure is one of the, the best things we can do right now at a time of low interest rates and go to, into a small deficit for three years. Why? Because we do need those roads and bridges. Why? Because we do need senior affordable housing. And why? Because we do need to address the deficits that have been piling and piling up. I was in Lang, north of Keene, the other day, and a woman's, the supports under her bridge just broke to get to her house. She now has to go 13 kilometers around, and they're saying it'll be a year, maybe two, before they get it fixed. That's what infrastructure does. Thank you. Russ? So Hector, that's quite a picture that you painted in your uh, opening. And um, I'd like to feel that we can attack these challenges together. And I'm optimistic that we can. So I think it's important to be optimistic about it. Um, government has an important role in our society. And the different levels of government need to work together with the private sector, with unions, with the non-government organizations, environmental organizations to deal with this holistic and systemic issue that you're talking about, because you really do have a whole ball of wax in there. So in terms of the questions, my qualifications, I have a track record of getting things done. I was the founding president in this community as a volunteer of the Campbellford Seymour Community Foundation. I think people in this community know about it, but we did take the net proceeds from the sale of the public utility which I was opposed to, the sale of the public utility, and we've given out uh, over two and a half million in grants over the last 10 years. I also helped save the Aaron Theatre in this community, and that's just one example of how we can use business succession strategies in small rural communities to better the community as a whole, because we have a lot of retiring business owners coming down the pipe. I have a business degree, I work with small businesses, I do business planning for a living, so I think my qualifications are there. In terms of your second question, municipalities and the federal issues and the impact on municipalities, how we work together, I think that's really important. I think that the current federal government has not stepped up to the plate in the way they can. And the downloading of the costs since 1995 from the Martin uh, Finance Minister, Chretchen's government, and then down to the province and Mike Harris, I know Dalton McGinty had promised to improve that, but it's not gone far enough, and I think that's why the Federation of Canadian Municipalities is asking the federal parties to step up, and that's what we need to do. Thank you. Adam? Well, thank you very much for the question there, Hector. Uh, you know, I, I'm going to be running, uh, I'm running for you to be your next member of Parliament because I'm going to get things done for you. Uh, for our area here, uh, you know, we've secured the funding for the Murray Canal Bridge, but the rebar still needs to be purchased, the concrete still needs to be poured, the shovel still needs to hit the ground with the Port Hope Area Initiative, and our government has been committed time and time again to making sure that we've delivered the funds to our area. Hector, I've been to a number of funding announcements with you. I know that we're, we're getting the, the funding to rural Ontario, making sure that we continue to support them. But at the same token, we need to continue to make sure that fiscal prudence is at every turning point that we make. Uh, and we are not going to continue to spend money, at our, money after money after monies uh, in order to be able to make sure... Uh, Sorry, let me, let me rephrase that. We can't keep spending money that we don't have. And that's what both of, both of our opposition parties have stated that they would do. Fiscal prudence must be at the forefront of it. And what, what makes me the best candidate? You know, this is, this is the area that I grew up in. Uh, this is where I grew up playing hockey, where I grew up hunting. Heck, I went on my first date here. Okay, and so I'm, I'm committed to the people uh, in our area in order to be able to make sure uh, that we are representing and advocating for their needs. And that is why I've been so focused on making sure that we're getting out to the rural areas of door knocking and making sure that we, we hear what, they're, what it is that they're wanting. 
Uh, and to do with municipalities, uh, I think that uh, we need to be, I know that uh, Bob Dodd actually sits on the Northumberland uh, as one of their advertising individuals. And we need to make sure that we're pushing and we're actually advertising our area on the whole. When you look at what Prince Edward County's done, they've sold uh, they've sold the county. They haven't sold individual places. And it's about selling an entire experience. And I think that that's what's important for us to do to make sure we can, can continue to drive tourism in here. As well, I think it's important that we continue to smaller support our small business community in those capacities as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mill. Are there other verbal questions from the floor? We get 30 seconds here, like that. <laughs> Go ahead. The corporate tax rate in 2008 was 21 percent. Now it's now 15 percent, and I understand that a lot of major corporations are outsourcing jobs to Ireland, India. You know, when your telephone goes out, you call. What do you get? Now the NDP want to raise it to 19 percent. Why would they want to raise the corporate tax rate when we're already got a problem? Thank you. For the NDP candidate. I'll let Russ answer that and the other candidates will have the opportunity to respond. Thanks for the question, Joe. Um, always nice to see a friendly face in the audience. <laughs> the corporate tax rate was 26% in 2001, and uh, the Liberals and Conservatives cut it down to 15%. Canadians want a fair tax system. That means corporations need to also pay their fair share. So the theory was, well, if we cut corporate taxes, they're going to create all these jobs, manufacturing jobs. They're going to do research and development. It's going to be great. It's going to be economic development. Quite the opposite has happened. They've sat on that cash. They've increased dividends, which is basically more money for the shareholders, but no job creation. $600 billion is sitting there in their coffers. So the tax cut didn't work. It was not an economic stimulus. And the United States tax, uh, federal tax is 35%. So raising it from 15 to 17 is going to be good for the government and the people of Canada. Thank you. <laughs> Any other candidates like to respond? Adam, go first. Well, you know, our conservative government has been committed to making sure that we lower the tax burden uh, on businesses as well as families. And we, we have lowered this tax burden. And the NDP are, are talking about tax hikes for corporations. Uh, and, and the flagrant disregard for small business owners from, our, from Justin Trudeau's party, uh, we are the only party that is here to support business. And that's what we're going to do. We've had one of the best job creation records uh, since the economic downturn in the G7. And we're going to continue to deliver our low tax plan because it is working. This is something that we, we have to be able to do to make sure we're supporting our business owners uh, in, order to make, in order to continue moving forward. Thank you. Patricia? The Green Party proposes raising taxes on large corporations from 15% to 19%. So the gentleman who mentioned 19 with the NDP, that was 17 them, 19 here. Because we feel that's still very competitive with the United States and their tax rate. And we also propose to raise taxes for wealthy Canadians, the 1% that control 12.7% of the wealth in the country. Thanks. Kim? To your question, I just want to just want to say, Adam, in terms of the uh, best job creation, you do know there are 1.3 million people in this country looking for work. I don't think that's a very good job creation record, personally. I do, in terms of the, um, sorry, I need my glasses here. <laughs> there is a, in this riding, we are a rural riding. We know our jobs are going to come from small business and entrepreneurship. That's where my focus is. Big business is not coming to Northumberland, at Northumberland Peterborough South, at least in the short term. We have an opportunity here. You know, we get into numbers about percentage increase, percentage dis decrease. People, we still have the provinces to deal with. The provinces also tax, biz tax businesses. So let's not kid ourselves that if we raise, somebody doesn't lower. And I hear this number that the U.S. is 34%. Yes, that's all in. We're just talking about... Oops. Thank you. <laughs> Next question. What is your personal position and your party's position on the Syrian refugee crisis? We'll start with Adam and work our way back this way. 
Well, thank you very much for being here with us tonight and asking that question. We've, uh, as I've been out knocking on doors, this, this has been a very serious issue uh, that has been brought up. Uh, our this, is, this has been a conflict that has been going on for a number of years now, and our government has, has taken in tens of thousands of refugees, and we're committed to taking in uh, an additional 10,000. But we have to remember that the security of Canadians is and always will be at the forefront of our mind. We cannot simply round up refugees like the other parties are suggesting and simply bring them here. We have to make sure that we go through stringent security processes in order to make sure that we keep Canadians safe uh, at home, and that is what our government is committed to doing. In addition to this, we're the only party that has agreed uh, and stated that we are going to continue military action. Humanitarian aid is one portion of the puzzle. We actually resettle one in ten refugees worldwide here in Canada, but we need to address terrorism at the forefront and on the ground. Russ? The Syrian refugee crisis, um, you know, Chris Alexander, the Minister of Immigration, that is just a shameful and embarrassing performance that he's had, frankly. And um, all this, you know, rhetoric about fear and um, terrorism, most of those people are just families with children. I mean, let's have some compassion here. As Canadians, we are compassionate people, and the NDP will bring 10,000 refugees if we're elected, 10,000 Syrian refugees to Canada before Christmas, and the United Nations is asking Canada to bring 46,000 refugees from Syria within the next three years, and we would meet that commitment because we respect international organizations, unlike the Harper Conservative government that just wants to ignore the international problems. We don't need the fear-mongering. We have good laws in place and checks and balances. We aren't going to import terrorism. Thank you. Yeah. You know, that's part of the rhetoric that comes out of the Conservative government. I have not heard one of the opposition parties suggest that we give up security in this process. I sure haven't. I, we as a country, our compassionate country, remember the Vietnamese boat people? Sixty-some thousand we brought in. We, we brought some into to this community. I was at an event, and it was probably not last night, it was probably the night before in Warkworth, and the churches were getting together to try and sponsor Syrian refugees. The Grafton Church, which United Church, which has already done one family, who I've had the pleasure of meeting last year, are now bringing in a family from Jordan. The roadblocks they're hitting you would absolutely not believe. That is shameful. There are 14,000 people, already pre refugees, already pre-screened by the UN waiting to come. And when I'm not getting into numbers, but I do know that we may have committed to these numbers, but there's less than 2,000 that we have actually brought in, and that's shameful. I share with Kim that correction of Adam's numbers that in fact only some 2,000 refugees have arrived from Syria to date and that the government has put barriers in the way of people coming from other countries uh, along the lines of the Bill C-51 legislation that uh, tells Canadians we're protecting you, we're making it harder for them to come because we're protecting you from terrorism. I don't totally buy that story. I think we can expedite screening, we can protect our national interest and the safety of Canadians by actually achieving the target of bringing 10,000 Syrians here by Christmas. I think that's a wonderful thing. And the Green Party is opposed to violence. I do not support troops in Syria. I support a negotiated settlement to issues in areas where there is um, Violence, we need to get parties set down and sort things out. Thank, Thank you. you. Next question. Hi. Um, every year, more and more young people are dying from opiate overdose, and it's happening here in our community. I know because I lost my son last year to a fentanyl overdose. Um, he was addicted for about five years, and we tried and tried and tried to get him help. But when he needed the help, there wasn't anything available. And when something was available, he was not ready. And um, so we need to um, get more help for especially rural communities. 
how will your party help us save the lives of our young children? And um, it's really hard for an adult, for a mother or a father to advocate for their children because um, everyone thinks that they're adults, but they're not able to make wise decisions for themselves while they're addicted. Okay. Um, you, that was my question. What will your party do to help? We'll start with Russ and work our way through. I'm really sorry for your loss. It's a sad story. Sorry about that. In terms of what we can do, I mean, you know, it sounds like your your son fell through the cracks to me. That's what it sounds like. I mean, it just wasn't matched, right? And you needed services and you couldn't get them. And then when they were available, he wasn't able to use those services. Yeah, well, I'm sorry, ma'am, in the interest of time, we need yeah, to just let them through. Right. Okay. It's, it's not just my son. It's, no, I understand, it's not, but you, I, as an example, right? Yeah. So our public health care system needs more resources. We need to hire more doctors and nurses. That's one thing that we can do. We also have a mental health strategy that the NDP is working on and would work together with health professionals in the provinces and municipal governments. So I think um, in terms of you know our social working and uh, health care and mental health strategy, that's where we need to go with this to help as many people as possible. Thank you. Kim? Thank you for sharing that. I can't imagine how difficult that is. There are gaps in the system. We all know that. I have a very good friend whose son has just become bipolar and she's going through the exact same thing as you are. When he's ready, it's not available. And when it's available, he's not ready. And because they're adults, technically, it makes it that much more difficult. I worked in children's services for many years and was on the board of Kinark Child and Mental Health. And I am very aware of not just the gaps, but of the fact that there are solutions. And yes, it does take resources. And that resources, it's money to some degree. But it's also a coordination of the system. Because we don't have a fluid system that allows people to come in the door and, and have that access when they need it. You're starting all over again every time you show up. I understand. And, and it's something I thank you for highlighting and something that I think is very important. And, and I'm certainly committed to working on. Thank you. Patricia? As a former healthcare provider in the public healthcare system, I have a perspective on narcotics. I have had issues for years with how easy it is for some people to gain narcotics and then sell them on the street to their own personal benefit to someone else's harm. And I'm so sorry for your loss. But I really believe addictions and mental health services, we do not fund well, provide well. I disagree with you, Russ. It's not a matter of hiring doctors. It's a matter of having teams, peer support, people who've been through this kind of addiction themselves. Those are the most effective people to be able to reach out and connect with somebody in the same boat. So that's a way of bringing them in and giving help. We have methadone clinics. There are four in Peterborough, I believe. There's one in Coburg. But if you can't get there, and in a rural community, it's tough. The transportation, it's wicked. And the pharmacies that dispense methadone are few and far between as well. Thank you. Adam? Well, thank you for having the courage to be able to come up here and share that with us. Uh, that that uh, under under, uh, for anybody would have been a very difficult experience. Uh, you know what, I know that uh, our government has been committed to uh, making sure that we, uh, uh, through our tough on crime agenda, making sure that we are trying to snub these drug issues at the source in order to try to be able to slow that down. But I think where the, the real problem where, where you felt that it lied was actually in the system that, uh, that, that wasn't able to fulfill that need. Uh, and th there are gaps in the system, absolutely there are. Uh, and we need to do everything we can to make sure that those gaps are filled so that people don't fall through the system. Uh, and I'm absolutely uh, open uh, to discussing and trying to figure out uh, what it is and how it is that we can fill these gaps, especially in rural areas uh, where people don't quite have the level of access that they should. So and thank you again for sharing that. So. Thank you. Uh, before we take the next question, I'd like to say to the people that are currently in line now are all the time we'll have for verbal questions, so please no one else get in line at this point. Go ahead. Uh, the biggest concern for me in this election is the structure of Canadian democracy and over successive decades in different governments, uh, Canadian sovereignty has been 
sacrificed at the uh, in the interests of international finance and international businesses uh, in, in the form of investor protection. Uh, under this government, that has continued in a way that is it's just it's beyond me how it happens. And, and examples are C fifty one, the Unfair Elections Act. We have in. Okay. Uh, Finish the question. This will be a debate. The Unfair Elections Act and also the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And Mr. Moulton, you in particular, I would like to know what you would do to restore the Conservative Party to its traditional values and away from the departure that it's taken. Yeah. So, <laughs> three talking points. Before we start, is everyone clear with the question? Okay. Yeah, Canadian we'll, sovereignty. Okay, we'll start yeah, with Adam, Adam, please. Adam, we'll begin. Thank you. Adam? Okay, well, thanks Thanks for the question there. Uh, you know, and I think that our government has been committed to ensuring uh, that we have delivered uh, the wills of Canadians at every opportunity. I think that no matter what it is that you do, the information that you take in, you always try to make the best decisions uh, at any given time and act in the, in the best interests of Canadians. With Bill C-51, uh, it was about making sure that we uh, making sure that we actually uh, were protecting Canadians, that we were making sure that our federal agencies had the ability to discuss with one another and, and share information. I can think of one example where three Edmonton girls made it as far as Turkey, but CSIS wasn't able to contact their parents to let them know. So it's about making sure that we're stopping the promotion of terrorism and snubbing that before it actually happens. And I think that, that that's with regards to Bill C-51, that, that definitely uh, is what it was that we were trying to do, and I think that it's important uh, that that will allow us to be able to continue protecting Canadians on that. Uh, with regards to uh, your corporate question, uh, with, with as far as uh, I believe it had to do with investments and shielding people from taxes. Uh, NAFTA. NAFTA, okay, so, yep, yep, Trans-Pacific Partnership. You know, our, our, our party has delivered 34 free trade agreements uh, across uh, across the globe. We have some of the, some of the best levels of access. Uh, we opened up with the EU Free to Trade, Trade Agreement. We opened up our businesses to have access to millions of consumers across Europe. And this is important. We need to make sure that we continue to assist our businesses in these ways. Um, <clears throat> with regards to Trans-Pacific trans Partnership, um, this has been something that we is an ongoing negotiation. And we're going to continue to act in the best interests of Canadians across all industries. And that includes supporting supply. You know, Adam, right. the thing is that all those free trade agreements, so-called free trade, because they're not really free trade, we all support trade. Canada is a trading nation. The issue is the investor protector, protection in, um, requirements in those agreements basically bypass democratically elected governments for a private tribunal, which makes its decisions in secret, to protect corporate profits. That's how it's set up. All those free trade agreements, I wouldn't be bragging about 34 free trade agreements because they're not fair trade. They're undemocratic. Talk to the one in transparent for negotiations. Adam, Adam, I've worked in democratic organizations for 30 years, cooperatives. The most important thing to have a democratic organization that's healthy is to have open and transparent information available. And the conservative government hides information. It does negotiations in secret. It muzzles scientists. It got rid of the long form census. Do you want me to go on? Like the point here is that we need good process to come to good decisions. And what we need in terms of fundamental democratic reform, there's two things we fundamentally need for Canada. One, get rid of the Senate. It's just corrupt. Let's get rid of it. We can do it. Second, we need a new electoral system that's called proportional representation. Every vote will count when we have that system. Patricia. We won't need a, a Senate. Patricia would like to comment. Hello. <laughs> Patricia would like to comment. I'd just like to get back to Adam's remark. If 34 free trade agreements negotiated by Canada are such a wonderful thing, why do we have 7% unemployment still? versus 5% in the United States. Kim? I'll make, I'll make my comment again about the 1.3 million people who are unemployed. Russ is right. We, we all believe in trade. We need trade as a country. But trade has to have reciprocity. If I'm giving you something, you're going to give me something back of close to equal value. That's how we trade. That's not how these trade agreements are working. And to the point of transparency, it is absolutely ridiculous 
that our scientists cannot publish their results and their findings for all the world to see. We should be proud and have them proud. Our, our Canadians and our, the work that we have done, the, the international community all learn from each other. That's how we get inventions. That's how we get the next cure for something. And this government has made sure that no scientist can talk unless it is approved by a minister and follows the talking points. And then it's really never happened. You know, I want to say that the proof is in the pudding. And with these free trade agreements, here is the reality. These are the real statistics. Ontario has lost 375,000 to 400,000 good paying manufacturing jobs since 2006. We, those jobs have been created by part-time precarious employment that pays low wages, there's no benefits, there's no protection in terms of job security. So 30% of Ontarians now are in those kind of precarious employment situations. That is not a success. The other reality is most of those free trade agreements that have been signed have not resulted in increased exports at all. So where exactly is the trade that's supposed to result from that? And, we'll and go the Bay we'll Act and Act oh, and just releasing that exports are continuing to rise for us. And with regards to manufacturing jobs in Ontario, and we, we, have, we, we need to continue to strike a balance between what we're doing out west and what we're doing in Ontario. But at the end of the day, these ever-increasing hydro rates, which is the second largest overhead cost for our manufacturing facilities, is chasing business out of Ontario. It, you, you get your hydro bills at the end of the month and how much they go up. Now imagine that for a manufacturing facility. One in five jobs in Canada are tied to free trade, and we're continue to, we will continue to support free trade agreements because they spur growth for our economy and it allows us to be able to continue to export our okay. goods. Kim? Let's, let's talk about the trade deficit. We have had 10 straight months of trade deficit in this country. You can't argue those facts. So to say that it's working, it's not. And you know what? I'm not even completely blaming the Harper government. Sometimes there are factors that they can't control. But at least admit it and try and fix it instead of keep telling us all these talking points. Russ? You know, Mr. Harper placed his bets on these free trade agreements. It's a failed plan. He placed his bets on the Alberta tar sands, and I call it the tar sands because I grew up in Alberta. That's what Peter Law, he called it. He was a conservative premier. That's what people in Alberta still call it, and that's what I'm going to call it. And placing all your bets on one economic sector is a foolhardy bet. And what you need to do is have a diversified economy. You need to encourage small business growth. You need to encourage manufacturing value-added agriculture, you need to find incredible and creative ways to get young people back into farming and encourage that process to happen, rather than having international land speculation. My neighbor just sold his fourth generation family farm to a Chinese consortium. Yeah, he made lots of money, but now all the food that's being produced on that land is being shipped to China. Patricia would like to make comments. I'd just like to get back to hydro rates. Hydro rates in Ontario are high because of bad debt, Hydro One, and failed gas plant construction and compensation that had to be paid as a result, and the refurbishment of nuclear reactors, not because of small projects that are encouraging people to look at clean technology and renewable energy like solar panels. Thank you. We just ran Thank you very much. Thank you. My Next question. question. My question also has to do with democracy. I know a lot of Canadians have been appalled with the behavior of the Senate in the last few years. I hesitate to lose our sober chamber of second thought because if another um, majority government gets in, then there's nothing to stop them from a tidal wave of bad decisions. I would like to ask Russ first, um, why you choose to abolish the Senate rather than reform it, and how much would that cost to change the Constitution? Well, I, first of all, it's, it's been the NDP policy for 50 years to abolish the Senate. And the reason is it's unelected and unaccountable. And basically it's been filled with bagmen of Liberal Party and Conservative parties for many years. Right now, there's six Liberal Senators and three under investigation and or at trial or awaiting trial. So that's called corruption. And 
I don't think there's, it's the system is broken. I mean, I don't think there's been much sober second thought there for a long time. There have been a few senators that have done decent reports, and I applaud them for that. However, it's few and far between, and I gave an example earlier tonight, how the Senate was whipped to stop the Climate Change Accountability Act that Jack Layton brought through, and it passed Parliament. So if we have a proportional representation system, we don't need the Senate because it's going to be an accountable parliament. Kim? Well, there's a small thing about Constitution. And I'm not suggesting that if a goal down the road is to abolish a Senate, that people shouldn't work towards that. But the reality is, right now, we need to pass legislation after this election. And our Constitution says that we have a Senate. And the Supreme Court has said you can't just let it atrophy, you can't not appoint people, as Mr. Harper said he is going to do. So, and I believe Mr. Mulcair said the same thing. Justin Trudeau has proposed that we have an independent body that is nonpartisan, that receives recommendations for appointments. They're completely vetted, and then the recommendation is made to the Prime Minister, then to the Governor General. We, I don't think the Senate is bad. I think who's in the Senate is bad. And so we don't need to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I don't get why we just abolish things and get rid of them. The Supreme Court has said it's not an easy process. You have to get all provinces, First Nations, and the Senate to agree. Good luck. Thank you. Patricia? <laughs> the Green Party supports reforming the Senate, electing senators, developing a procedure to make that happen, and taking it across the country for input consultation and then putting it to Canadians as a national referendum and there would be definite oversight of the Senate and by changing the structure of the PMO, the Prime Minister's office, that influence on the Senate would be gone. So I think it is possible to have an effective, sober Chamber of Second Thought that is elected and represents Canadians. Thank you. Adam? Well, you know what, as Kim stated actually there, the Supreme Court has made it very clear what it is that we have to do in order to be able to see the Senate abolished or reformed. We have to have uh, all of the provinces uh, in a grant. And when you look at a province like PEI uh, that has its highest form of federal representation uh, in the Senate, uh, it becomes very, very difficult to do that. Uh, the NDP are claiming that they're going to abolish the Senate, uh, but it's just, it, it's going to be, it is one of the more constitutionally difficult things to actually attain. And I know that I'm not going to go to Ottawa and move the needle from 0 to 100, but it's about moving it from 0 to 50. What's that next attainable step? I, mean, I, I grew up in a home that, that was for the abolishment of the Senate, and so I, I would love to see it go, but the fact of the matter is, is that it's not going to be able to happen that easily. And so we need to undergo significant reform changes, because at the end of the day, any, any flagrant use of taxpayer dollars to the manner that's been happening is not okay. And our party has been very clear that we will not support that. Thank you. Next question. In February this year, the Supreme Court struck down the provisions of the criminal code outlawing physician-assisted dying. No matter which party forms a new government, Parliament will have to make new legislation to enable this ruling to be carried out with proper guidelines and conditions. Do you support, each of you, do you support the right of Canadian citizens who face debilitating chronic illness to choose the timing and manner of their own death? And would you support new legislation to enable physician-assisted death? Thank we'll start you. with Kim. Well, this is a short answer. Yes and yes. The Liberal Party of Canada has uh, come out and, and clearly said within our statements uh, during the platform releases that in fact one of the first things we will do is convene a committee of parliamentarians, physicians, clergy and social workers and other people who have a contribution to make the, that discussion. So we ensure that we're getting it right. And the Supreme Court has been very clear. We need to go back to the, to the table and negotiate it. In terms of um, po liberal policy, it was overwhelmingly supported at our convention uh, a year and a half ago, and I personally support it. Patricia? The Green Party supports physician-assisted death, and so do I as a personal issue. And I would just like to say that we need to set up guidelines, criteria, 
so that this cannot be something that people fear might be abused as a power tool of some sort, but rather a tool of compassion that will be effective and will allow a death with dignity. And it's really important that it not be um, just medical people that are involved, but pharmacists need to help with the choice of drugs, the dosage of drugs, etc. So I'm giving a plug for my profession. There's a big role to play here. And we don't do a good job of palliative care, and I think that's part of the reason why people are now clamoring for death with dignity. If I still believe we need to do a lot more education of physicians about palliative care and comfort measures. Thanks. Thank you. Adam? Well, thank you. Uh, you know, as you stated there, the Supreme Court has ruled uh, that legislation does need to be passed on this matter. Um, but we need to make sure that there are protections for vulnerable people in that. Uh, right now, currently, there is an advisory panel that has been put together that is consulting Canadians. And they actually have a website. And so if you'd like to know, I have, I have it written down here, ep-ce.ca. And this is where it gives you the opportunity to be able to go on there and express your concerns. If it's something that you that, that you do feel passionate about, uh, it allows you allows us to be able to to understand what it is and how it is that you would like us to see uh, move forward on that. Uh, now, as as your representative, uh, it's not my job to go to Ottawa and represent my own views. This is a very uh, black and white issue for a lot of people, uh, but I am open to listening to all of your concerns, including yours, uh, to let you, and, and that that will ultimately determine how I will end up voting. Russ. You have to ask yourself, why did this issue have to go to the Supreme Court in the first place when 80% of Canadians want some form of choice around physician-assisted death? And why did our government, conservative and liberal before that, stand in the place of the public will for this issue? I have very personal experience with this because two weeks ago my own mother died. She was 93 years old. The last two or three years she had dementia. It was a horrible decline. She starved to death in bed. That's what happened. She had pain relief. But my mother was a proud, dignified, independent prairie woman who would have definitely chosen to have an assisted death. And, you know, religious beliefs aside, my mother was an atheist, and it wasn't about religion for her. It was really about dignity. And she was a nurse, and she often helped older people, and she would have been appalled at the conditions that she died in. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. On August 30th, TBO aired a program called The Great Canadian Tax Dodge. And it talked about um, profits and incomes that aren't being taxed in Canada, money going to tax havens outside of this country. <clears throat> the numbers released on Monday from the federal government said that we brought in $181.4 billion. That's just income tax, personal corporate. How much could we have brought in if our Income Tax Act was reformed to close loopholes to keep our tax dollars in our country? we we'll start with Adam and work our way back. Uh, well, as I've gone along this process, I've actually had the opportunity to interact with some people from the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, and they've had a lot of different comments about how it is that we could reform our tax code to either a, make it more simple, uh, B, make it more streamlined, uh, but with regards specifically to what it is that you're talking about, uh, that is something that I know that the CRA uh, does handle. They do go through to be able to figure out uh, how, to, how to gain tax dollars from Canadian companies when business is completed in Canada. And so as far as that banner goes, uh, that would be the CRA's responsibility to be able to, uh, to, be able to capture those tax dollars to make sure that we uh, have them moving forward. Thank you, Russ. You know, Adam, you just said that it'd be better if the tax system was more simple. Well, your government's not doing much on that level because the reality is all these lousy boutique tax cuts that you guys make, even your friends at the Fraser Institute say it's too complicated and that people can't afford to hire a chartered accountant to actually make sure they get those tax credits because it is too complicated. So I'm not sure what you're talking about around simplicity. In terms of these tax havens, this has been going on for a long time. And Paul Martin, when he was the finance minister in the mid-90s, made sure the tax code continued to allow that. And he benefited from it personally through Canada steamship lines, <coughs> through tax havens. And it's appalling, right? That's a direct conflict of interest when he was the finance minister. So what we need to do is hire more CRA staff 
and give them the tools and the ability to chase these people down and make them pay their taxes, just like the rest of us do. I'll tell you, as a small business person, when I'm behind on HST, I get the call from CRA. Thank you. Kim? Okay, Russ, just to know, the trick is not to be behind on. <laughs> As small business, no, I'm teasing. Small business owners, we all forget sometimes. Just in terms of the tax code, what this conservative government, Russ mentioned the boutique tax credits. Do you know that the tax code is now the length of five football fields thanks to the conservative government? But think about that. How's the average person supposed to find their way through that? And boutique tax cuts sound good in a soundbite in an election time, but the reality is, unless you actually have taxable income, which a lot of people don't, especially a lot of seniors, if you can't hire a fancy, uh, high-priced accountant to figure them out for you, you're probably not going to get them. And don't forget, you have to have the money to spend first in order to get them. The other thing is the cuts to CRA. No matter what the conservatives are saying, they have cut the services to or, uh, departments like CRA hugely, and we're suffering. Thank you. Patricia? I appreciate your question, and I certainly have no idea how much more we can recover for tax revenue. Watch the program. Pardon? Watch the TVO program. Thank you. Right. Yes. But I, I do know that the Green Party wants to raise tax rates for wealthy Canadians and also close tax loopholes to prevent this kind of thing from happening. That's part of the fully costed Green Party platform. But I also, on a personal level, wonder about the ethics of companies like KPMG. And the issue last week was about Canadians investing in the Isle of Man. And when you know investigative journalists went there to have a look at what was being invested in, there was a shell. There was an empty building there. So what about these chartered accountant business accountants leading Canadians to put money in places that maybe aren't? really there or aren't legal. Thank you. Next question, please. Okay, I want a simple yes or no, so it'll speed things up. Thank you very Will much. Will your party or you lobby to bring back the long gun registration? We'll start with Patricia. Yes. Kim? No. It's not in our platform. Absolutely not, but I would like to let you know that both Kim and Russ in the 2011... It's a yes or no question. That's all the man asked for. They both supported it in 2011. Thank you very much. That wasn't the question, Adam. Thank you very much. Sir? As part of the mayor's eloquent uh, question to you folks, he mentioned, <laughs> he mentioned the issue of water soldier in the trench Severn. Now, you're talking about $250 million to fix locks and things of that nature. I want to know what... Would each of you, if you are our elected representative, do in the way of, at the federal level, in the way of money and time to eradicate this problem? We'll start with Kim. He wants to eradicate the water soldier problem that's in the Trent Severn. What would your party do to... What would you do in, in the way of time and money as the representative of this area to eradicate it? Well, as I don't know what the costs are, and what the time is, I would have to ask those questions. But of course, we would support getting rid of it. From what I understand from Hector and from some other people, it is causing some serious damage. So if somebody has those facts and figures, I'd love to have them. There's, there's the, the independent Sorry. order on... Uh, Sir, you've asked the question. Just A lot of people have the information. Sir, time for you to... Thank you, please. <laughs> Kim, are you finished? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, there's, no, there's no give and take. Okay, no, I'm wondering, but okay. Um, I'll just leave it at that. I would appreciate, I will look up the information myself and become informed, but any invasive species that is affecting our waterways, it's affecting our, our marine habitats, or affecting our, our tourism, and all those things we use the Trent Severn for, has to, has to be taken care of. So, of course, we can, I'd commit to it. We would commit to it. Thank you, Patricia. I think the Green Party supports reinvesting in all the agencies whose funding has been cut that actually support our wonderful environment here in Canada. So definitely that includes conservation authorities, Ministry of Natural Resources, Parks Canada, Fisheries and Oceans, and we need to um, empower those people to deal with issues like invasive species 
So this is a specific one. I mean, zebra mussels years ago, we've had plant species, purple loosestrife, and now we've got giant hogweed. A lot of things are going on and they're not being managed when they could be. Thank you. Adam? Well, thank you for the question. Yeah, I, I've, I've talked a lot uh, to my neighboring candidates that also have the Trent Severin uh, going through the ridings, and this has been an issue that they've brought up as well. Uh, and we've, we've committed to making sure that we, we do fight to be able to resolve this issue. Now, I, I'm not going to stand here up, up in front of you today and promise you that 100% will be able to make that happen. I'm not, I'm not going to make you a promise that I know as a fact I won't be able to deliver on. But what I will tell you is I, I will champion that issue in Ottawa. I will fight for it. Uh, I will learn more about the situation and, and gain a greater understanding for it because uh, that affects so much of the communities that, that do rely on the Trent Severn for tourism uh, and even for one of my own passions, fishing. Uh, and so it's important that we continue to support the Trent Severn uh, in that capacity and I will promise you that that is an issue uh, that I will take to Ottawa. Russ? I would work together with local communities and Parks Canada because it is Parks Canada you know, property to ensure that we address that issue directly around the water soldier because it's clearly going to be a continuing problem and we need to deal with it. Otherwise, the Trent Severn waterway is going to lose value. Thank you. This will be our last verbal question from the floor. And my question is about climate change and what you're going to do about renewable energy. And I know some of you have tried to speak about this and I think it's really important. Not only is it important, but it's the biggest threat to Canada's security, health, economy. So, this current government lives in denial that climate change is taking place. We all know that it is. We're seeing dramatic, extreme climate change. We're experiencing drought and floods that we can't control. We don't know what that's going to mean to our own food production. And yet, we continue to subsidize the oil sands for $240 billion a year. I want to know why that money isn't being used for developing renewable energy. I'm not seeing my gas at the pump go down, even although the cost okay, of the barrel your question down. Is, is that it? So my question is, what are you going to do about renewable energy? And will you reduce or, re or get rid of those subsidies to the oil sands? We'll start with Patricia and work our way back. The Green Party of Canada wants to go off oil, fossil free, by 2050. In order to do that, we need to stop the subsidies to the oil industry now. And we need to start putting money into research and development of clean technology. We already have a nub of clean technology development happening in Guelph, Ontario. And we need to train young people and we'll create green jobs by supporting that change in our economy, moving from oil, fossil fuels, to green, green technologies and renewable energy sources. So that will solve the climate change or reduce the climate change impact and also create jobs in the green economy. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. I'm, I'm glad we had an environment question specifically for this. And I guess my perspective is that we're the stewards of the environment. We're not the shareholders. We don't get to do with it what we like. We have to protect it. And there's a couple of things that, that uh, Justin Trudeau and we have said that we believe are a priority. We don't, the provinces have gone it alone in terms of greenhouse emissions as an example. About 85% of the country is already covered by a plan because in the absence of federal leadership, they've had to create their own. So we have said that we will create a framework similar to the Health Accord, where we negotiate with the provinces and territories to find the way forward to make sure that we address that. And it will have levers and strings, just like the Health Care Accord does in terms of the funding. I guess the other thing I quickly want to mention is the fact that our target is now 2100 to get our greenhouse gas emissions to at least close to where they need to be is sad. Thank you, Russ. So the fossil fuel subsidies, the NDP has been talking about that for years. We would get rid of those. We would take those back and use the money to help develop renewable energies. I think there's so much that we could do in terms of energy conservation, which has a two to three year payback. I mean, you're never gonna get that kind of payback from anything. 
So that's an easy thing to do, but it also creates jobs like um, Ms. Sinnott was saying, because it's uh, something in our communities that, that we can create jobs for young people by actually working on climate change and at the same time helping people save energy on those hydro bills that Mr. Uh, Moulton's talking about. So what's lacking here is leadership. And the NDP would provide that leadership and we would go to the international um, conference in Paris in November with clear measurable targets and a clear plan to meet them. Thank you. Adam? Well, thank you very much for joining us here tonight and asking this. Uh, you know what, our, our Conservative government, uh, we've been the only government to actually reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And we've also made a commitment that we would reduce hey, greenhouse everyone. gas emissions by 30% below 2005 by 2030. And so we are committed to this. Now, by the same token, to simply move off of oil is something that is, at this point in time, unrealistic. We need to continue to make sure that when we, if we are going to switch over uh, to green energy, that it is sustainable. Because what the Ontario Liberals put in place with the solar panels is the fact that they were paying out ridiculous amounts of money to buy your power, and then they were selling it at a fraction of the cost. That's not sustain sustainable, and that's affecting me in my pocketbook, because those are our tax dollars they're using to do that. And it's, it's simply not sustainable. I am all for making sure that we continue to look in for sustainable forms of energy, but only if it makes, only if it makes fiscal sense to do so. Thank you. For those of you that didn't have the opportunity to voice your questions, I encourage you to pick up literature at each one of the candidates' tables or speak directly to the candidates. We'll now reverse our order. Each candidate will have three minutes for their closing remarks. And we'll start with Adam. Well, thank you all very much for being here this evening. Uh, it's, it's great to have so many people out here. Uh, and you know what, a big, the, the reason why I'm running to be your next member of Parliament uh, is in order to be able to get things done for you. Uh, and uh, you know, we've seen, uh, if, Rick, if Rick Norlock had a re-offered, I'd be the first person standing beside him to support him uh, because Rick had an ability to get things done. He kept the Trenton Air Base open for Northumberland Quinty West. He got the funding for the Port Hope Area Initiative, which they've been requesting since the late 70s. And our government has paid attention and made sure that they have, they've understood the concerns of our local residents here. But at the end of the day, uh, the bridges still need to be fixed. The concrete needs to be poured. The rebar uh, needs to be purchased. Uh, and in addition to that, when you look at things like the Workworth Penitentiary, that creates hundreds uh, of jobs and supports hundreds of families. Our government has supported that institution uh, with continual infrastructure upgrades uh, to make sure that it remains open. And uh, our other parties up here, with, with their tough on crime agenda, uh, the love them into loving us, that, that's not an approach that's going to work. Uh, and our, we are committed to making sure that we keep our streets safe and that we, we continue to make sure that you have a place to raise a family uh, that you're not concerned about. And that, that's our government's approach to that. Uh, you know, we're, we're committed to continuing to lower your tax burden. Uh, believe it or not, your, your tax burden is actually at its lowest level in 50 years. We've cut taxes more than 160 times, and I know it may not seem like that, but every single time we've lowered taxes federally, the provinces increase them on us in order to be able to make up for their large deficit spending. And that Ontario high tax, high spend solution has not worked for Ontarians, and I'm here to tell you it is not going to work for Canadians, and people, I'm hearing this at the door, people are understanding that. Uh, in addition, we will continue to fight for small business. Uh, we have one party up here uh, that is against corporate business and the other one uh, that claims that they're for small business and yet supports their leader on an economic advisement team that continues to trash small business owners. And the simple fact of the matter is, with 99% of small business owners uh, making up uh, the businesses across Canada, we have to support them. They contribute 40% to our GDP and, I'm and, I will, and I will make sure that I fight uh, for what it is that's important to them. Um, and, and again, you know what, our party, and let, let, us, let us not forget, uh, we, we are uh, in very uh, uncertain times, globally speaking. Uh, our Conservative Party has committed and will remain uh, to having a strong stance on the international stage. Yes, we do need to be compassionate and bring in refugees, but the security of Canadians has to be at the forefront of our minds when we do that. 
In addition to this, we have to continue forward uh, with military action because it's the right thing to do. We've done it from the forests of Germany to the mountains of Afghanistan, and we will continue to stick with our allies. Thank you. Russ? I'd like to thank all of you for being here tonight and sticking through the time. I appreciate that. I'd also like to thank the organizers, and Jeff's done a great job. Let's give him a hand. I also want to thank the uh, organizers for changing the format, because I've been asking for years to have this debate format, and we got it tonight, so that was great. It was way more interesting as far as I'm concerned. Um, Adam, I hope you'll change your mind about the remaining all candidates meetings. You're only attending one more all candidates meeting. The three of us have been, this is our third one today. We missed you at the other two. We missed you at the one on Monday night. I really think it would do you well to get more practice and to come out and just communicate to people about what you want to do. How do, how do people make a decision and an evaluation about your abilities and ideas if you can't communicate them to people and they can't hear you and see you face to face. So I would really strongly encourage you to do that. Now in terms of Canada and the kind of country, we know we live in the best country in the world. There's no question. All you have to do is travel to other places and when you come home you realize it. And we can do so much better here. We can build a pragmatic society that takes care of each other through our public health care system. We've talked tonight about preventative health care, about pharma care. There's other things we can do. We need a national dementia strategy. We need a national um, mental health strategy. We need leadership from the federal government. The NDP believes that government has an important role to play in all of our lives. It's not something that should be just shunted aside and starved of resources and then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy that government's no good and our public health care system's no good because it's been starved and now we just have to have privatization. Privatization is not a solution to these things. The conservative government has cut taxes, cut taxes, cut taxes, made government smaller, smaller, smaller. And who benefits from that? You have to ask yourself, who benefits? It's certainly not the Canadian people in general. But it is the wealthiest 10% that are benefiting from all those tax cuts, for the most part. That's the reality. We need to deal with youth unemployment. We need to work together in our communities and with different levels of government to deal with. That's a fundamental issue. People's lives are being stalled because when they, re they uh, graduate from university or post-secondary education, they have $28,000 in debt on average. So they move back into their parents' basement. Well, that sucks. Honestly, for everybody. So I think we need to take some of these issues and find some pragmatic solutions. The NDP has a plan to do that, so I hope in the advance polls and on October 19th, you will vote for me. I would really appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Uh, it's getting a bit cooler in here, so thanks, thanks for your perseverance, and I see all the fanning happening. I want to talk about a couple of things in closing. And one are partnerships. The, best, the way we find the best ideas and the best solutions and the best way forward is with partnerships. We had our mayor, or your mayor, uh, read a very long question about some of the concerns he has and how are we going to address that. Well, not one of us can address it alone, but together we can. And I want to just tell you a little something about my plan. My main focus for this riding will be jobs. And I had the good fortune to meet Steve Lawrence in Kendall a week or so ago. Now Steve owns Dare to Dream Honey and he has an amazing operation. He's a farmer, he has a very small production, but has some great ideas and some contracts online. But he fell through one of those funding cracks because of geography about where the, the Eastern Ontario Development Fund starts and where it stops. And he reached out to all the candidates. Now I understand Russ didn't get the email, but Adam, he gave you his business card at the Lifestyle Show in Newcastle, and he said he to tell you that he was very disappointed he didn't hear from you because he wanted to talk to you. So I went out to the farm and met him. He's a brilliant idea. So I, speaking of partnerships, 
I contacted the Chief of Staff of the Minister of Agriculture, Jeff Leo. I told him about the idea. I saw the business plan. I provided the information. I can't promise to do anything. But I can promise to raise it and highlight it and do what I can to promote. And you know what Steve's operation is scheduled to do in the next few months? Bring on 15 to 20 jobs in Kendall. That's the kind of work we need to be done. And I have been doing it my whole life. For the past 30 years in this riding, I have been creating jobs. I have been a mentor. I've been an entrepreneur. And I'm going to ask you next week, to watch for my jobs plan that we have been working on for the past year and a half. Understand my appointment to Justin Trudeau's economic team was not a photo op, it's a job. And we have been creating a jobs plan for Northumberland Peterborough South for the past year and a half. I have three PhD re researchers, job specialists, we've been talking to employers, we've been talking to employment service companies, and we've created a job plan that will be released next week. So I encourage you to watch for it and see what job creation in this riding can do for us. Thank you so much for your attention tonight and have a safe drive home. Thank you. Thank you. Marcia? Climate change is real. Choosing between jobs and the environment is not an option. And oil prices are falling. So half of Albertans are now living paycheck to paycheck. Yet more projects are coming online and production is increasing beyond 4 billion barrels per day. The oil sands are the single largest emitter of greenhouse gases in Canada. It's got to stop. And rather than transporting bitumen by rail across the country, in pipelines or by rail, Greens support refining of bitumen in Alberta, creating jobs for Albertans near the tar sands, the oil sands. It's going to take some time to get away from our dependence on oil, so that's the green solution. No more pipelines, keep it where it is, refine it where it is, and then when you do transport it, it's not as explosive or flammable as diluted bitumen, which contains organic solvents. That's what caused the problem with the lac Megante disaster. Instead of subsidizing big oil to the tune of $1.3 billion a year, Greens will invest in clean technology, apprenticeships, and energy from renewables, as well as small businesses that retrofit homes, the jobs that Russ mentioned, to, uh, and public buildings. Half of the energy we use in Canada, we lose through leakage from buildings. So we need to stop that leakage and conserve, and that'll reduce our energy requirements a great deal. We need to diversify Canada's economy, and research shows that green economies actually provide twice the jobs of oil-based economies. I'd like to take a moment here and explain the carbon fee and dividend credit. It's important to put a price on carbon, and the green plan is to tax carbon at source, when it comes out of the ground or off the ship, whatever, and gather that revenue, and that revenue is then paid directly to Canadians. And at tax time, those with lower incomes get to keep more of it. And those with higher incomes will have it clawed back, just like now happens with OAS for seniors. Many thanks to the Trent Hills Chamber for organizing this event. Thank you to my colleagues. That's the first debate I've ever been involved in, so that was a new experience. I hope you'll go to greenparty.ca and look at the fully costed platform there. We have a lot of good ideas in that platform. And you'll see how the Green Party plans to build a better Canada, a Canada that works together by invigorating the economy, building sustainable commuting communities, engaging First Nations, and encouraging people to eat local and supporting local business. Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you. I'd like to thank everyone in the audience for coming out this evening. I'd like to thank the candidates also for joining us. We appreciate your participation on the panel. And we commend you for your interest in serving Northumberland Peterborough South as our elected federal representative. Thank you, everyone. Good night.